Okay, great. I think we're going to start. So a uh, very warm well welcome to everyone from uh, over here in St. Catherine's College in Cambridge. Um, <laughs> we've got a slightly uh, not very well populated room right behind us. So this is going to be quite an interesting sort of hybrid event we, as we talk to a large screen and hope that more people um, start joining us quite soon. Um, so my name is Liana Chua and I'm currently the Hunko Abdul Rahman University Assistant Professor in Malay World Studies here at the University of Cambridge. Um, and as part of my broad remit, um, I also convene an occasional series of talks that focus on Malay World Studies um, that really try to um, highlight the research that's being done on this region here in Cambridge and also to, to draw together various Southeast Asianists um, from across and beyond the university. And so today I'm absolutely, absolutely delighted that we've managed to catch <laughs> Dr. Majid uh, Ganeshka, who is this year's Mundi Fellow at the Cambridge University Library. Um, we've, uh, we've, we've sort of uh, had to postpone this talk once, so I'm very glad we managed to catch uh, Majid before he disappears from Cambridge. Um, Majid, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, is an alumnus of the Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies in Germany. He's also previously worked and taught in Germany, New Zealand and Malaysia. Um, and he's done extensive research on pre-modern and early modern um, Islamic and Oriental sources and also com uh, compiled what sounds like an amazing census on Islamic manuscripts in a whole bunch of different languages, including Persian, Arabic, Urdu, Hindustani, and Ottoman Turkish. Um, and his publications include a monograph, um, Studying the Quran in the Muslim Academy, that was published by Oxford University Press in 2020. Um, so while he's in Cambridge, Majid has been working on the Malay Islamic manuscripts that belong to the famous 17th century Dutch Orientalist Thomas Rapinius, uh, which are held here at the UL, as well as various other related Malay Indonesian manuscripts in the university's collections. And I think part of his aim is really to try and put the, the material here in Cambridge specific to this region in conversation with other sources and developments um, within uh, the sort of wider yeah. um, world. So I, th I think today's talk really aims to do a little bit of that, um, yeah. where we can be hearing a little bit more about mysterious gravestones in Southeast Asia. So yeah. welcome, Majid. It's great to have you here. And um, yeah. I'll let you take the floor now. Yeah, thank, you yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. OK. And uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining me. So first of all, I would like to thank my, my colleagues at the, at the University of Cambridge, mainly Leanne and Chua, where, I mean, uh, we, we've been in, in contact for several months in order to find a date, and we are happy that we got this date to give, it, give this talk. I also thank my colleague uh, uh, and friends, uh, Professor Michael Finner at Kyoto University and the Maritime Asian History so, I mean, a rips a survey or mass at Kyoto University, and as well as my friends and colleagues in Indonesia, including uh, Shafruddin Mashkur and uh, uh, Kuswanta. Both of them helped me a lot in order to examine some rare and old Persian inscriptions in the Indonesia. I also thanks uh, Professor Kalus, Ludwig Kalus, um, for granting me permission to. Uh, Used the pictures and photographs from his foundation, so the was the Pegagraphic Islam. Okay, so let's just start with the uh, mysterious grave stones in Southeast Asia. So, okay. Uh, first of all, I let let me explain what do we know about Persian elements in the Malay Indonesian world or uh, what are the what is Persianism in the land in general? What do we know about it so far? Uh, Alessandro Bozan uh, is the uh, famous uh, Italian Iranologist and a scholar of uh, Malay Indonesian world. So he believed that there are around 220 Persian words in Malay literature, which are either used by people in their daily life or even are found in their liter literary sources. After that, and later on, Rachel, a faint, very good as Dutch scholar, believed that there are around 300 Persian words in Malay literature. And, through, and after that, over yeah, several I mean, decades, I've been working on different Malay manuscripts, and I realized that there are actually more than 300 Persian words in Malay literature. And uh, yeah, so uh, apart from that one, we have, uh, so I think just a moment, yeah. Okay, so we have 
other aspect that Malay and Persian contributed to Malay history is about inscribing Persian. So, and uh, by inscribing Persian, I mean that the way they produced or wrote something in Persian and then also translated. What you can see is OR 7056 in the Leiden University Library, which is an anthology of poems. And uh, it was it is a unique one, actually. It's one of the oldest, or what we can say that is the oldest known Islamic source in the Malay, in, in the Malay language. So for example, what you can see on top of it, uh, let me use the laser point, the tab. Mm, yes. So, for example, let's read from this side. One dam masi hama murda zandaka yap nafais as nafase par bermula dari pada tiu nafas sa segala orang mati jadi itu suatu tipu dari pada suatu tiu dari pada nafas nyawa yang melarakan dahulu jua. So the way they translated, uh, the way they translated. Uh, Persian into Malay, it's very interesting and I think very compatible or, I mean, with uh, the, the, uh, the Persian prototype. Uh, this one, yes, okay. And apart from anthology, of course, like what you can see is the oldest known Islamic source in the Malay Indonesian world that we have. So this one, uh, we have also official letters in Malay, in Persian, that has played the role of lingua franca. So the way Malay used Persian in order to have communication or exchange letters with other communities from other parts of the world. For example, you can refer to the recent article by Dr. Annabel, I'm sorry, Dr. Andrew Peacock, so who wrote about this issue. We have direct quotations, many legal and mystical sources we have that the, uh, in, in, that for example, once they wanted to describe some Fiqhi or legal sources or mystical sources, they refer to uh, they refer to I mean, Persian phrases or they add their quotations from Persian materials. We have also church, they also translated Persian texts in full and a brief translate and versions. For example, most or oldest known uh, Malay folk stories or Kikaya were translated from uh, Persian into Malay from the 14th century. They were really common. And after that, they were really, I mean, uh, they play an important role in shaping Malay Muslim identity, like the Hikayat Muhammad Hanafi or the, the killing the story of Hassan and Hassan, the grandson of Muhammad. So that story was used by Malays for centuries, and even it was, I mean, very helpful or instrumental for them once they wanted to confront Portuguese in 1515. Yeah. So, and, uh, so we have like this, or even GG 640, the third treatise of Treaties of this manuscript uh, at Cambridge University Library is the first known and oldest known Malay translation of the Persian ethical work, Akhlaq e Muhsani, uh, by Vaiz e Kashafi, a Persian scholar of the 15th and early 16th century. So the first Malay translation is kept here in Cambridge University Library, and they translated it around, I mean, in, in mid uh, 16th century. Malayos also started to interpret Persian texts, like, for example, mystical words. A good copy or good word sample would be OR8399. This one kept in the Leiden University Library and is a very valuable source because, well, at that time, we know that in the 14th, 15th, 16th, up until the 18th century, the debates, the heated debates we, we witnessed among the scholars about falsafa, kalam, or uh, uh, Sufism or tasawwuf. So the way they kind of, they, they interacted with each other, I mean, a scholar was a huge debate at that time. And uh, so mystical words like OR8399 is about, this is a response to such debates. And you can see the way they, they describe Persian sources into Arabic or into Malay. Another aspect that you can find an influence of Persianism or Persian elements is, uh, and is usually, off, it's often overlooked in, uh, in uh, Persian, Persian studies or the, once someone gonna examine the influence of Persian in the world, they ignore to what extent Persiani or Persianism contributed to Islamic science. So the uh, Islamia or al Islamia, like for example, we have Ayim al 
or Khulas al Mustaq, which is about the Arabic grammar, OR 1666, given in the Leiden University Library, this manuscript tells you clearly that Malay started to learn about Arabic through Persian. Also, Tajweed or recitation techniques of the Quran or commentaries on the Quran, we have OR 17 of Marburg University Library, you can see that the text is clearly based on a Persian source. Another aspect is about the way Malays put, I mean, moved further and they started to, mess, to domesticate Persian letters like Pe or Gaf, and they have their own Pe and Gaf once they wanted to, to inscribe Persian words. So what about inscription and grave stones? Uh, can we see or expect some influence from Persian as well in the Malay Indonesia? Let's go for the next slide, which is still, I would like to ask you to, to stay with me because I want to say how we started to revise previous scholarly conclusions about the expansion of Islam through Sufism in the 16th century in Indonesia. We know that, or scholars believe that, Islam in the 16th, Islam was systematically moved throughout the Malay Indonesian world from the I mean, before 16th century, but what we know there were the first sources, first extant sources telling us about the status of Islam in the Malay Indonesian world belong to those of Mal uh, Hamza Fansuri, a 16th century Malay scholar who wrote three treatises, mystical treatises, uh, also, and he has some poetic uh, works. The point is that. Hamza Fansuri is known as the father, and many people call him as the father of Malay Islamic studies or Malay Islam or the founder of Malay mysticism. So all information about him are about after 16th century, like the manuscript OR 7291 that you can see is, was, is for after his death, it's a copy of his works. For a long time, that was a, it was a I mean, definite answer given by scholars of Malay studies. All of them agreed that this source was, uh, I mean, the sources of Bansuri are the, are the I mean, foundation of Islam in the Malay Indonesia. So whatever we want to know, whoever wanted to talk about the history of Islam in the Malay Indonesia, or they refer to Hamza Bansuri. Until a few years ago, we found, or we started to, to edit, translate, and, and uh, uh, published OR 7056, an anthology of poems, which is Persianese uh, and Persianese Jonga uh, Farsi, Jonga Ash'ar Farsi. So this manuscript, after I published this uh, article, already Balzani and Burgenski talk about that, but I went further and I examined different aspects. I edited the text in different forms and formats. And, uh, Oh, sorry, thank you. And so this, this anthology of poems after it was published, that I was advised by my colleague, Dr. Annabelle Gallup of the British Library to be carbon dated. I, went, I sent it to be carbon dated. The results show that 70 persons belong to before uh, 1512 uh, and mostly for after 1415. And then I examined other aspects like uh, Asian elements in the text and even the uh, poem poets whose names are found in this anthology of poems. And it is clearly that it is it was produced before Hamza Fansuri. Uh, and so it was very important. And even what you can see in there uh, in the in, in this table is the OR7056, the anthology of poems or um, or Jonga Ashore Farsi, includes some uh, couplets or poems which are also used by Hamza Fansuri uh, several decades later. For example, Chun Azme Tamashaw Y Jahan Ta Kalla, Ahmad Bi Tamashaw Y Jahan, Aidi Jahan Shu. That Kalla Bar Handak Iya Min Jalani Alam, that Tang Iya Dari Pada Alwa, Min Jalani Alam Itu, Jadi Iya Samatu Alam, or Samata Alam. So this translation is very good, actually. And what you can see, there are, I mean, those of Hamza Fansuri are slightly different. But the point is that before Hamza Fansuri, we have a poems. Persian poems, which are related to the concept of wahdatul wujud or the unity of being a very common or famous uh, trend of mysticism or Sufism, I mean, inspired by Ibn Arabi uh, and after that promoted by Persian poet, poet, sorry. So this source tell us that Hamza Fansuri was 
not probably the leader of or Sufism in the Malay and Indonesian world. And we have now evidence telling us about earlier than Fansuri, pre-Fansuri period, it means that Islam was common. So what about inscription? So let's start and see the first inscription. So this one that you can see is, is kept in Barus in Sumatra. So it's dated 772 after Hijra and is 1370 AD. It's an early Persian inscription. And uh, what you can see is uh, it tells you that. So let me read from this side. So it says, Wafati Sayyidi Marumi Sayyidatu Nesa Tuhan Ummi. I want to stop and don't want to say what it is. I think it needs to be examined further to make sure about this one. But it says, Bitarif Shreem and Safar Allah Bil Khair was Safar Bithana Ithna was Sabin was Sabamiyah. So it tells you about the death of uh, a fiend, I mean, a woman, and this gravestone was made by his son, apparently, and it dated uh, 772 and 1370. So the way, the first phrase you can see, Vafalte Seyyidiye Marume Seyyidatum, so it's clearly Persian, and it's one of the earliest sources telling us about this. Uh, gravest stone about the 14th century gravest stone has been written based on Persian influence. Probably, uh, some people assume that probably the date of this one should be changed, but as far as I check, I will examine it further, but as far as I check, the date is correct. I mean, 1370 is the date of this inscription. So let's go for the next one. So this is very important, actually. I have a forthcoming article jointly with Dr. Michael Feener. Uh, is it the second inscription, which is of, again in Barus, Indonesia. It is date, data 829, which is from around 1425 or 1426. This is an inscription ascribed to Ferdowsi. So let me read it for you. So see the crown side of the crown side of the, the greatest stone. So this stone. Jahan. The translation would be, the world is a perpetual remembrance and we all live it in the end. People will leave nothing behind but their good deeds. So according to this, I mean, tell us about the influence of Perdusi. Some people, this is debated whether it belongs to Perdusi or not. But what I want to say that, Exactly this phrase and exactly this couplet, I mean, this part, I mean, this poem is found in Japan as the oldest Persian document in, kept in Japan. Exactly the phrase by phrase, word by word, are found in the Persian document in Japan. So it means that all of them were in the same period, people were very much interested in the works of, uh, in the works of Ferdowsi or whatever was ascribed to Ferdowsi. And I think this is very important. I, mean, I have a first coming work about this, very important telling us about the circulation of uh, ideas taken from Shahnan or other sources ascribed to Ferdowsi throughout the Indian Ocean Road. Uh, if you want to have more idea about Shahnan or the influence of Ferdowsi, we have other elements in, 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 in manuscripts you can find the traces of uh, Ferdowsi too. This is the part of uh, the Hikayat Muhammad Hanafiya, or the killing story of Hassan and Hussein and the rise of their brother, their half brother, Muhammad al Hanafiya. So uh, a part of that, and this is in Malay that you can see, and it is very old, actually, this is very old. And I believe that it was copied by someone having connection with the Middle East. Anyway, I wrote an essay about this a few months ago. But it's a rumah Rasulullah, and then you can see here it says bait or bait, which is a Persian one. And here, this is what I say, Malay is Persian. So this is a Persian phrase. So let me read it for you. So actually, this is the Malay version of Persian bait or couplet. 
ascribe to Ferdowsi, Zena Pakzade, Madal Omid, Kazangi Bishostan, Nagar Sapid. So, which can be, uh, which is based on as a satire on Mahmoud al Ghazni. So, it is a very uh, racist, uh, uh, racist uh, poem or couplet ascribed to to Ferdowsi. So you can see that not only in gravestone from the 15th century, but also in Malay Hikayat from the 14th and 15th century and 16th century, which were really fundamental in shaping Malay Muslim identity, like the Hikayat Muhammad Hanafiya, we have couplet ascribed to, uh, to Ferdowsi. Let me read it again, because some people join us recently. So then I'll pause all day, not all you. And then you can see the Malay translation. So once they wanted to translate instead of bait or bay, they, they use the term ertinia. So what you can see, ertinia daripada orang. So this is the very nice translation. And then so it tells you about the way I mean, someone should be clean or be white or purified. So this, which is very interesting translation, actually. So it tells what extent people are that. 14th and 15th century, we're familiar with Persian, with Ferdowsi, with uh, Iranian or uh, Persian literature. So let's go for the third inscription. So the third inscription is, uh, uh, can we remove this one? Please? Okay, no problem. So the, the next inscription that you can see is also from the uh, 15th century. And uh, this one is, uh, I think, one of the most important inscriptions that should be taken into account. And my reading of this inscription is different from those of uh, Professor Kalus and his colleague. Or, and uh, I, I'm sure that this is a highly likely as a she source, and it can change the direction because you know that we we have an idea that Shiism was not common or was not well received in the Malay Indonesian world and what we have is Ali piety. But this one has potential to change the discourse and giving us more information about to what extent Shiism was an active trend in the Malay Indonesian world. So first of all, it belongs, this gravestone stone belongs to the daughter of Maulana Muhammad al Istarabad. So Maulana Muhammad al Istarabad. Istarabadi's family were quite active from the beginning of his life. I mean, traveling around the Muslim world. We have, for example, some Stravadis who died in Mecca, whose grave are in Mecca. And uh, they uh, actually during the formatic period of Islam. We have also Nizamuddin Stravadi, who has a long poem about uh, uh, Shi Imams. Uh, or we have also uh, and another one who, and the people who copied the works of Nizamuddin Starabadi about Shi Imams, some of these copies, like the one in the Cambridge University Library, was copied in Karbala in the shrine of Hussein ibn Abi Talib. Uh, sorry, Hussein, uh, Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet. And uh, so this is the first, I, I mean, link or hint that we can say probably would be related to Shi. But another thing is about the inscription itself. This is very unformatted. I tell you that it's clearly a Shi text. So I, let's read it from here for you, and you can see the text there. Marok Shafi e Anam Panj Tan Basan Debobat Peru Zahaj Bedan Panj Tan Rahonam Tan Nabi Doctor Guzi de Damago. Do Pesa Muhammad Fatime Ali Hussainu Hassan. Walahi Salat, Walahi Salat was Salam, and the rest part I need to examine it carefully. But what you can see, I highlight it. The translation is this. So the poet, first of all, this is the, this poem inscribed to Muhammad ibn Ali al Badari of Razi, perhaps from the 11th century, mid 11th century was very common, famous, I mean, poet at that time. And many people wonder whether he was a Shi or a Sunni. And whoever wanted to say that he was a Shi poet, they refer to this poem. Interesting. Another one was, let me translate it for you. Having five intercessors on the day of judgment would be sufficient for me to get rid of its physical torment. So who are those five people? 
Prophet Muhammad, his daughter, selected or elected son-in-law or groom and two sons, which are Hasan and Hasan. So we know that in Shi'i literature, then calling Ali as the elected son-in-law or selected son-in-law of Muhammad, either as groom or as the leader, is common in Shi'ism, more common in Shi'ism than Sunnism. And I think this is clearly a reference or allusion to Shi'i nature of this inscription from 15th century, from Gudong in Sumatra, which is very important. So I think this inscription have potential to change the discourse, telling us more about the existence and circulation of Shi'i materials. Okay, next inscription. So this one is the celebrated inscription in the Malay in the in, in Malay and Asian literature. So this one in, belongs to Naina Usamati. So I just focus on the Persians. It's because, I mean, because of the time that we have. So it includes the lyrics of Sa'adi of Shira, the famous and celebrated Persian poet of the 13th century. And uh, interestingly, this stone and this, and I mean, this stone was imported from India. So except for other inscriptions or gravestones, stone, which most of them are local, made of stones from Indonesia, this one came from India. And even the calligraphy is very much Indian. So, I mean, similar to those of India, coming in India. So we know that in Nas, Suls, uh, or Sulus, and Torah, uh, uh, as well as Nas Ta'alif and Ta'alif were common calligraphy in India. So, but Melindria changed the direction. I will talk about it soon. But this one is very important source telling us about the, uh, um, uh, the role of Saadi in the Malay Indonesian world. And this is important because uh, Dofing, what you can see here, I mentioned the name. Dofing was a young uh, designer and photographer. And at the turn of the 20th century, he was in Sumatra. And he got a picture of a very good picture of I mean, some inscriptions. And this is from his source. But in 1940, we have the first article by Hendrik Kofan or Kovan, the Dutch scholar. And I, I translated it into Persian a few years ago. And this was the first indication about the existence of Persian inscription in the Malay world. So this is my favorite, I mean, um, an uh, inscription because the way they wrote it about it, the couplet, like uh, what you can see, it's clearly, for example, these two parts. Um, let's read this part for you. Kalkat darus tohan rabadi, number four. Kalkat darus tohan rabadi, nafsikhin de charge. Maunan de so medon kadaron tu tiawala. So, and you can see the translation. So, people may wonder or raise a question. So, Saadi or other Persian poems were common or were read, their words were read in, uh, in India, that was right, right? But what about, so probably they got it from them. So I think that Malay Indonesian had some, they, uh, they were organic in terms of producing Persian sources too, because they not only geographically, they were far from India, they were connected to India, but they were far from. India and the heartlands of the Persian world, right? The Persian in India or Iran. But anyway, they had some, you know, they had, they were keen to produce uh, Persian sources in their own context in the Malay and Indonesian world. A good example would be, again, the anthology of poems that I talked about before. So this anthology from the 15th century, what you can see is again, a famous uh, lyric of Saadi, I will read part of it for you. So you can see the way they translate, I mean, uh, Persian into Malay. I think it's very good. And it is the date of this, this 
manuscript is, I mean, it was produced at the same time as this, ins this inscription. So it means the Malay Indonesian new side, new Persian literature, and they read it and recite it together. And this is another indication of the contribution of Persian inscriptions. So let's go for the fifth one, the inscription from Pasai Sumatra. So this is a good one too. And the picture was originally taken by Dufink and also from, you can find it in so the was the Afi Islamic. So yeah, we have so the date of this manuscript 1440. So what you can see here is Sana, right? They tell you about the year. Sana Arba Warhuna was Saman Mia. Taullah bin Ismail Ismail. So many people, I mean, like, I mean, former scholars, two or three studies examined this. All of them misread this part and they wrote, read it as Shah or Shah. They called it Ataullah bin Ismail Shah, which is not correct. Actually, it says about it bin Ismail, Shabe du Shabe, no home mahe rabi So it can be translated in the year 844 or 1414. Ataullah. Son of Ismail, the night of Monday, the ninth of the months of Rabi ul Awal. Persian speaking communities, even I can tell you in some part of the western part of I mean, India, or in Oj, or in Bukhara, Balkh in Bukhara, it used to be like that, and even in Iran. So we know that when someone says, for example, Shabi uh, Dushambe, it literally is not about, is not Monday. Or this is not about Monday, it is about this about Sunday. As I said, the night of Monday refers to sometime late in the day on Sunday, also reflecting Malay conventions of referring to an evening with reference to the day that follows. Malam Senin in Malay is very common, right? So Malam Senin is evening of Monday. So this is very common in Persian speaking communities. And it tells that not only Persian script, Persian poem, but also Persian expressions. Persian idioms and the way Persian communicated with each other made and wrote to the Malay Indonesian world. And it even tell us more about to what extent Persian had influence on that region. Uh, apart. So let's go for the next one. So this just remember, remember that this man, this inscription dated 1440. So what about this one? This inscription is exactly what's produced in 1442. I mean, okay, 14. Right, so both of them, and this one and the last, the one from the last slide, were produced at the same time. So this one is also from in Bruin, thanks to, as I said, in the mass of the Kyoto University, as well as colleagues like Meshkusha Fordin and uh, Swanta in Indonesia, who provided me the pictures of this uh, inscription. So the right side, and the right side of the, the inscription, you can see. So let me read it for you with the using laser ball. Had al Babratu Han Mat. Mabalat Minat Dunya Kham Yaum Khamis, Aisna Asha Yaum Shahrul Hijjah. Min Shahrul Hijjah. Yeah, it tells you about it, the, the way or the our lady who died in Dul Hijjah. And the, uh, the other is inscription, the last side tells you more about the details of this inscription. So it says, Sana Arba'a wa Arba'una Thamana Mi'ah. So it says the date or the year she died is 1440 or 844 after Hijrah, right? And then we have the this two boxes that you can't see, which was very difficult. I, mean, I, I remember when I wanted to read it, it was not easy. And uh, this is the start with, uh, I mean, I, I wondered what, how you, they were talented to place this very difficult outlet, I mean, in this robot uh, into this small boxes. So rules that basatu damu namidomista. So 
من جمله تو بودم و نمیدانستم so the way i read it is not the persian one i mean the one that is practiced in iran is very much that of the because of you can see it's not gurde is gurda so once you say dan gurda bodam so it change your dialect you lahjet arabi when dialect get changed and it is a very from balkan bukhara which is a common one track so this is a this, this is a very famous couplet i mean either ascribed to Rumi I mean, or uh, Kermani. When we publish article about this one, we receive email from both Malay Indonesians as well as Iranians. So some wonder whether this is that of Rumi or no, that's of Awhadidin Kermani. I, I, I think in, in, you can find in both sources. But the point is that they were promoted through the works of Bakurdin Iraqi, the guy whose main part, I mean, the portion of his uh, Poems you can find in the Malay anthology of poems that I talked about from 15th century. So interesting, but the striking points about this inscription, which I think is very important, and try and help us to push back the borders I mean, and even the literature and tell them that Sufism and Islam were common in the Malay Indonesian world before the before comes of Ansuri and in 15th century we had common i mean sufism was common really was practice and it and this is a good example of that let me show you you can see the translation by the way so what's the point i mean the striking point about this part so first of all this poem is about or unity of being and is not about death unlike former inscription that i showed all poems or lyrics deal with the concept of death, death after death, or life after life, or the other world, the hereafter, dunya wadafara. So all of them are about that one. But this one is not about that. This one is about the concept of wahdatul wujud, the unity of beings, which is, I think, very important. And tell us more about the existence of Sufism and also commonality. Uh, I mean, uh, popular or popularity of Wahdatul Wujud, unity of being before Hamza Fansuri. So it is. I think Hamza Fansuri was was someone familiar with Persian among many others who, who knew Persian. And Sufism, and yeah, this, it is, uh, this is what I want to say about the relationship, to what extent it is not about death, and to, to what extent it, is, it tell us more about, and from, give, give us more information about the existence of Sufism before Fensuri. Okay, so those were the main inscriptions I wanted to talk about, but let's talk about mapping the journey. So we, you can see here is Sumatra, right? and Malaysia, Singapore, Kedah, and Penang is currently here. And then we have Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka, Tamil Nadu, and Andhra Pradesh, and other parts of Hyderabad. So in all these regions, we have Persian inscriptions. And you can see the distance between these two regions. But Malay Indonesia started to produce their own inscriptions. And I believe that we should expect finding more inscriptions in the future from these regions. Moreover, we have, we witnessed circulation of, we, we can, I can tell you that, they, I mean, about the circulation of Persian manuscripts and Persian inscriptions throughout the Malay Indonesian world at the same time. So wherever we have these inscriptions or grave stones in Persian, there we have also uh, Persian manuscripts. So another idea is if we have Persian manuscripts that we already found in Banten or in Java, this region, or we have in Palmar, or we have in Jambi, we have in Medan. So we should export even in Malacca, in Kedah, or even in Southern Thailand, or in Thailand, even Burma and Thailand, we have Persian manuscripts. So my idea is that we should expect finding Persian inscription there too. And I think that 
it is it is an ongoing project. We have we found more inscription from these regions having Persian, um, including Persian inscriptions. The gravestone stone with Persian inscriptions growing fast. And I think it changes the discourse and tell us more information about to what extent Persian and world and Malay world were interconnected. They had close relationship with each other. And this is what we really need to think about. And I think that we need help us to re rewrite the history of Eastern Asia or Southeast Asia. And I would like to say that, I mean, I will talk about it later, but this is not a one way road. I mean, this is a double side highway that in, for sure Malay and Indonesian had influence on Iran and Persian and world. So maybe in the future we'll talk about this. So about um, and further thoughts, as far as I checked and you already would have noticed, Malay Indonesians had their own calligraphic style. So once you compare the Persian inscriptions in Bihar, Bengal, Surat, Adha, and, and Andhra Pradesh, Arakan, in Burma, or in, in China, you can see that the way they, uh, they inscribe Persian is very much using by means of Nas Ta'lib, Ta'lib, Nas Tulus, or Sons. Uh, pen, which is quite different. And Malay Indonesian had their own style. The way they produce or promoted Persian using their own form and calligraphy style is, I mean, is distinguished and we should take it into account. Uh, moreover, I think that they were, Malay were in the position of notebooks or sample as their words are precise. So they're in their manuscripts are sometimes you can find grammatical or decorative errors throughout Malay manuscripts. But once you go through their inscriptions, the story is different. They are really precise. To, to large extent, they are precise. And I think they were in the position of notebooks or samples. They had something to read before, I mean, uh, and they had it before their eyes once they wanted to inscribe something. And uh, another point would be about the Indian movement and reception of Persian in the Malay Indonesian world. So we have, uh, uh, for example, uh, this is important to you know, the period that we observe the circulation of uh, Persian, the circulation of Persian inscription in the Malay Indonesian world. Uh, you can see at the same time it's happening in India. Here in India, we have the Tughlaq dynasty, yeah? Tughlaq dynasty and then Timuri dynasty, and they had influence on uh, India and Delhi, and they promoted Islam. And we know that according to the statements of Dr. Qiyamuddin Ahmed, who, who, uh, who produced the corpus of Arabic and Persian inscription on Bihar, the Tughlaq period is marked by another new development, the beginning of the use of Persian language in the inscription. We come across Arabic occasionally, but from the 14th century and wars, Persian clearly started replacing Arabic as the standard language of inscription. And it is true for Malays too. Malay started to welcome Persian after the 14th century significantly. And you can see this one of the 17th century. We know that Persian had influence up until the 1914 in the Malay religion world. We have evidence. I wrote some article about them before. And we have some forthcoming projects telling us to what extent Iranians and Persian speaking communities were active and living, uh, were, I mean, living in, in Indonesia in the 20th century. And before that, they were really, I mean, active. But it is important to know that, they, I mean, the, uh, the best period for Persian to move around Southeast Asia was from 14th until early 17th century. And during those periods, we have the concept of Wahdatul Wujud or Sufism and other trends of mystical trends, all of them promoted through uh, Iranians or Persian speaking uh, poets. And I think it's really much related. We should see it along with the, uh, the journey of Persian throughout India. So in the, there in India, Ferdowsi, uh, Sadi, Jami, Hafiz, and all of them were read, right? So I, I think they had influence of Malay Indonesia world too at the same time. But current Malay started to become independent from Indians by using their own calligraphic form, by selecting a specific phrases or words, or showing their interest uh, to Persian in different ways. Uh, okay, and this is if, if you're interested, a good reference would be our article published in 
a few months ago, actually, and uh, was a joint paper in honor of Peter Riegel, or you can, for a picture, some picture you can find in the Sezawoste Begarati Islamic. And uh, thank you very much for your kind attention.